fantastically fine modern horror stories. And with that, I will hand over to Trev. Away you go. Thank you. Thank you. I'm blushing already. Um, <laughs> My, my, my expertise with the puppetry is, is actually mainly to do with Punch and Judy, although I do know a little bit about other forms. Uh, so tonight, for those of you who aren't familiar with him, this is, this is Mr. Punch. Um, he's known as the, the, the national puppet of, uh, of Britain, uh, uh, but he does have various relatives in France. Uh, he has Polchinella. Um, in uh, Russia, Ukraine, um, you have uh, um, Petrushka, the Petrushka puppets. And um, obviously he has his, his family background is actually from Italy. Um, he's been around for over 300 years, about 350 years. And uh, what I'm going to look at tonight is basically how he changed very much in the 19th century. Um, Punch has never actually been the same. He's always constantly changing. And uh, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to have to give some historical background up to the Victorian period so we know what we're uh, dealing with. And then I'll, I'll look at some of the, the better known things about, um, about uh, punch during that period. Um, I, can't go, I can't go very far because it's a very deep subject as I found out when I was reminding myself about it in the last few weeks, I kept coming up with new things and I'm going, oh God, should I put that in? Should I put that in? So anyway, um, Punch and Judy, the march of intellect, the changing face of Punch and Judy in the 19th century. So Punch and Judy, for, the, for those of you who don't know the tradition, it's very much seen today as a children's show. Uh, in Britain, it's famous for being at the seaside, um, children's parties. Um, he crossed the ocean to America and uh, the, the Americans also have a tradition there. Um, one or two things that I'll be mentioning aren't very politically correct. And this is something we find in um, today's society quite often. People kind of get offended at Punch and Judy. Mind you, people get offended at everything. Um, so we'll look at some things We'll look at some things there. I might make some references to current practices or, or practices outside the Victorian period uh, to make a comparison. Um, obviously, not everybody knows about uh, the tradition, but um, we'll see how it works. OK, so now how do I do this? Punch's origins. Um, Punch was first recorded in 1662, to be specific, the 9th of May, 1662, uh, by Samuel Pepys in the Covent Garden area. And he recorded in his diary that he was going to see, or he had seen a, an Italian puppet show that was very pretty. And we know this was by a puppeteer known as Signor Bologna. And the, the situation with Britain at the time, we'd just come out of the Republic when it was the, the Puritans and the, uh, the Cromwellian era, where theatre was largely banned. Funnily enough, puppetry wasn't banned specifically, but theatre was largely banned. And with the restoration, um, it became the growth industry. And a lot of traveling theaters, mainly from Italy, um, came over and they were doing very well. Um, and one of the things was Signor Bologna's punch. And punch comes from the Italian character Pulcinello, who is part of the Italian Commedia dell'arte. So he has the mask 
Um, you can see the stick there. Um, what, we know, what we know is a slap stick, and it's two bits of wood together. So it makes a nice noise. This is where you get slapstick comedy from. Um, so, whoops. Pulcinella came over as um, a live action, uh, uh, an actor driven theatre, um, as well as a puppetry theatre. In Italy, it had existed for quite a while. Um, now, the important thing to remember is that what Peeps would have seen was very, very different from what we would now see. And Peeps also would have seen a marionette, so with strings, whereas Punch, as we know today, is what we call a glove puppet, so it fits on the hands. And there's uh, quite significant reasons and differences for this. Um, so as we can see here, uh, we have what we call the, the Chinese shadows. I'm, uh, these are a shadow form of, of uh, theatre. Um, interestingly enough, the, the Polish word for shadow is, is chen or something like this. And I've often wondered if there was a connection between that word and, and the word Chinese or whether they really were Chinese because we know a lot of the players came from uh, Russia. Um, anyway, so the Italian theatre comes over and we can see Pulcinella changes from this character here to this kind of character in the bottom right hand corner. Um, he's a hunchback, so his hump becomes more exaggerated. His stomach uh, becomes more exaggerated and the mask figure of the nose is very prominent. Um, it's quite possible that he borrowed some French uh, elements there as well, because the Commedia dell'arte players basically came through France, influenced French traditions. Uh, France has this character, Polchinella. Um, so if we look a bit further on here, we can see this, uh, I think is Southwark Fair. So it's a painting from around the late 18th century. And we can see punch players here, uh, what looks like a, a theater at the back here. And again, these would be traveling players. They made a lot of their business in fairs, in um, markets, on the street. And they were, they were, again, marionettes predominantly until about the late 18th century. What we notice at this point is that you know, we've got live players as well as puppets. Um, the Commedia dell'arte dell characters actually fed into the English pantomime. Um, and for, for those of you who maybe aren't familiar with English pantomime, pantomima, it's not silent. It's very active. It's very, a lot of clowning, um, a lot of audience participation, talking to the audience, getting the audience to sing. Um, it's a bit of a misnomer calling it uh, pantomime. But uh, um, Now also around this period, there's a gentleman here who is actually Irish. And his name is Martin Powell. And he was a puppet master, a great satirist, um, and he did a lot of satirical shows using the character of Punch. Now, funnily enough, as you can see, he's, uh, he's got some physical differences there. I believe he was, uh, he was of short height, um, 
had a bit of a hunchback himself. And so he actually did shows in theatres, big shows in theatres. He was very, um, very prolific, very active, very famous, very successful. Um, he died around 1729. So he was active for, say, the first uh, 25, 30 years of, uh, of um, the 18th century. Um, what's interesting here is the comparison. Uh, one, of the, one of the more noted historians of Punch and Judy, um, uh, a man called Robert Leach, who's, I'll, I'll give the details of his books and things at the end, uh, Leach pushes very much the idea of Punch as a rebellious um, counterculture kind of character. Um, now, this is true in quite a lot of cases, uh, particularly in the Italian tradition, but as always, there's also um, an audience in the more established uh, theatre. And a uh, man called Shersho, he's written about the idea of cultural appropriation uh, between the, uh, the, if you like, the high theatre and the low theatre. And one of the things he points out is that Martin Powell actually did shows for the government uh, to parody um, political, uh, political uh, groups at the time or, or religious groups. Uh, in particular, there was a, a group called the French Prophets who were, they were kind of one of the proto groups of the what became the Shakers, um, better known as an American uh, religious movement. And they were connected with the Quaker movement in England. They were getting a bit awkward for the government. So the government actually asked um, Powell to do a show parodying them. And uh, he did a show called Punch Turns Quaker where Punch becomes a Quaker minister. And apparently it, uh, it really undermined the, um, the status of the French prophets in London at the time. So the reason I'm, I'm talking all this is so we've got this idea now that Punch is accepted on two levels. He's not strictly a street character. He's also known in the, the higher theater as well. Um, as a puppet. Now, around the middle of the 18th century, getting into the late 18th century, um, Punch changes very much into a glove puppet and um, using a booth. So why is this significant? It's significant for several reasons. One, marionettes are, they, they need space. So the marionette theatres were designed to be set up quickly, but a marionette is one person working a marionette. So you need two or three players at least. Um, also, the marionette player has to be above the theatre. It has to be above the stage. And they have to be above the stage because the puppets hang down. And so obviously they need quite a lot of room with a glove puppet, you can do two puppets at once. You can change the puppets very quickly and the action is quicker. So, you know, marionettes can be quite quick, but they, they can't cross the hands because the strings get tied up. With a, a, a glove puppet, as we can see, you know, we can move the hands around I can throw things, I can catch things, I can move them around, that can... Oh, 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 oh. And so the action gets quicker, the style of playing gets quicker, and also you only need one person, so you keep all the money. Um, and it's a bit easier to transport. Um, around the... Uh, let me just check my notes, just remind myself. Um, 
around 1750, uh, sorry, uh, 1779, a man called John Piccini, Giovanna Piccini, uh, also known as Porcini uh, to a lot of the English speakers, came over from Italy. And he came over with his brother and he was performing uh, Pulcinella punch shows. He arrived in it. He arrived in Britain, um, 1779, and he died 1835. And he was performing for somewhere in the region of 30, 35 years, maybe more. Um, why is Puccini important? Uh, Puccini was the first punch glove theatre show to be recorded. His is the first script we have of a recorded kind of street punch. And there's some debate as to how much of it he developed in Britain, uh, how much punch was anglicised. Um, obviously, being in Britain that long, Puccini had actually managed to, to speak some English. Um, and he, uh, he, he introduced various characters, which we'll, we'll see in a, a moment. Um, by the time he was recorded, he was recorded in around 1828. So he was quite old at that point. He was, uh, he was uh, I think, in his 80s. Um, he wasn't the big star anymore. He was a bit of an old man. And um, a man called John Payne Collier decided that he wanted to record him. And he went along, got Puccini to do a performance, and he got George Cruikshank, the famous artist, to do the illustrations. So if we look here, okay, um, this is the one of the pictures by Mr. Cruikshank. Uh, apparently the, the eyes could move, the eyes were, were jiggly eyes, but we can see the kind of theatre that he would have used. He would have had a, an assistant to carry the theatre and it was a fixed frame. If you look at modern frames, they can fold away. They fold away very quickly. This had to be very solid. It had to be able to be carried around and it would be wrapped up in material when it got there. So the puppeteer would usually have um, an assistant, someone we would, we would call a bottler. And a bottler would collect the money uh, the reason they're called a bottler, supposedly, is they collected the they collected the money in a bottle, which, if we look at this bottle, I just happen to have handy. If you put the money in the top, when you turn it upside down, the money can't come out. You have to break the bottle to get the money. So uh, your bottler can't, you know, take the money out until the end of the show a lot of the a lot of the bottlers would also play maybe uh, pan pipes were very popular and drums and they would control the crowd particularly the children so let's have a look at mr puccini's show um okay one of the problems with um, John Payne Collier's script is, as some of you might know, he was well known or he became well known as a literary fraud. He, he produced some fraudulent uh, uh, examples of, of Shakespeare and some other things. And so even today, we're not sure how genuine this script is. Um, you heard Punch's voice. Uh, Italian puppeteers use something called a pivetta, something you put in your mouth to make the make the voice. 
Um, in Britain, we call this a swazzle or a swatchel. Um, and some people have said that they don't think that uh, Puccini would actually be able to say a lot of the dialogue and do the songs with this swazzle in for such a long play. Uh, however, that's that's uh, debatable. Um, again, maybe he did this in one scene, maybe he did it in a couple of scenes. We don't know how much Payne Collier added. But what we do know is it's the first recorded example of a Punch and Judy show as a glove puppet. And it, uh, it has basically become the the plan for almost every Punch and Judy show afterwards. They all follow the same idea. Um, Punch has a, an argument with his wife and uh, he, he ends up disposing of the baby, killing the baby. Um, he and his wife have a fight. She ends up dead. And then he meets a range of different characters um, a doctor, a policeman, um, the hangman, the devil, the ghost, and they all basically end up the same way, um, in some more inventive ways than others. Now, some of these, some of these are still with us today. There's been some new ones, and um, as we'll see, the show's all always changing. So if we look at the ones that are in Puccini's show, we have at the top, top left here, we've got Punch, Judy, his wife, Judy, and the baby. Um, in the older shows, we know that Judy was known as Joan, Joni. Some people have suggested that the name changed because it's easier to say with a swazzle. It's easier to say Judy than it is Joni. However, Mr. Shershow, who I mentioned earlier on, he points out that at the beginning of the 18th century, Judy was a kind of slang word for a woman who was living in unmarried situation. Um, and then I suppose in places like Liverpool, they use the word Judy for, uh, for girls. I, I don't know if there's a a kind of judgmental comment on that but um so it was definitely a slang word for a certain type of female um judy as you can see looks very much like punch uh she's not a shrinking violet violet she's uh, uh she actually beats him up first um before he he turns the tables um in the older shows you know, they, they would have a lot of uh, banter, a lot of dialogue. Um, she leaves him with the baby and he can't be bothered with this screaming baby. So he throws it out of the, he throws it out of the theatre. In, in some ones, he, he bashes its head out against the side of the, uh, um, the stage. Obviously, these days, it's not really the done thing. So people find other ways of, uh, disposing of the baby. Um, I, I have to be careful when I throw mine out of the theatre because uh, I'm always worried the kids will never bring it back. Um, Punch then, you know, being a man, as soon as he's got rid of his wife, he runs off to his girlfriend. Um, his girlfriend's known as Pretty Paul, and she comes from the Beggar's Opera. So we can see that the theatre was actually, uh, the Punch and Judy tradition is borrowing things from other theatres. So Pretty Paul doesn't do much. Um, she, uh, she just flounces around. Um, she disappears from the later shows when public morality starts kicking in. And uh, obviously you can't do a children's show with a, with a sort of harlot, you know, strumpets. Um, if we move over the, the way, um, we'll see this character here. Um, I'm just moving him because I don't know if you guys can see it because of the uh, camera thing. Um, 
this is just a man whose neck grows. There's a the the puppet has a has a particular mechanism, and he just sort of stands there, and his neck grows up. And this is one of the things you find in the Punch and Judy show. There's there's just characters who are there um, just to make just to add a bit of variety. Um, at one point, Punch meets a blind man, and the blind man coughs in his face, so he gets dispatched as well. Um, Punch has a horse. He goes for a ride on his horse, uh, Hector the horse. And then later, he, he meets a doctor, and the doctor decides to give him very physical medicine by beating him. So, of course, he does the same thing to the doctor. Um, it's interesting, uh, as we'll see later when we talk about uh, Henry Mayhew's interview with the Punch and Judy man, he specifically comments that Pretty Paul and the blind man are, are out of date within 20 years of Puccini's play um, when this happens. Um, I don't know how accurate that is because I've actually performed with the blind man uh, from an original. Uh, set so uh, who else do we have um a dog called dog toby who becomes quite well known he bites punch's nose uh the owner of the dog down here on the bottom left is called scaramouche and we have a fight scene um punch is condemned to death and the hangman comes to hang him but punch outwits him he uh he asks, he asks the hangman to show him how to put the noose around his neck. So, of course, the hangman shows him and Punch hangs him. The interesting thing about the hangman is he's, the, he's generally only uh, other character than Punch who has legs. And that's because he has to get hanged and you have to see his legs waving around. Um... He's often known as, as Jack Ketch, who was a, um, a famously incompetent executioner. Um, and uh, in later, later times, he becomes known as Mr. Ma uh, Master Marwood, who was the uh, state executioner who developed the, uh, the long drop, like the trapdoor and the drop. So he's, he's known as Ketch or Marwood. Um, I think in Bacini's, he's still known as Ketch. And then Punch meets the devil. In Puccini's version, he, he beats the devil. Um, the, the last line is, oh, the devil is dead. Um, in some of the older texts that we know of, the devil actually takes Punch to hell. So it's a bit like Faust or something like this. Um, one thing to remember with these shows is a lot of it comes down to the individual performers. There are cases where somebody, somebody didn't like the audience, so he got the devil to take punch to hell, and the audience almost wrecked his theatre, um, and he didn't do it again. What happened, what we believe happened later on is, again, when uh, kind of religious and public morality got very strong, um, the devil actually became a dragon um, and later the crocodile. So a lot of people would know about the crocodile in Punch and Judy. And we think he, he comes from the, uh, from the devil, or a lot of people think this. Um, I have heard people suggest it was more connected with London Zoo getting a crocodile or the crocodile in Peter Pan, but he seems to appear a lot earlier than that. Um, the bottom right, we have, uh, this is one of the more controversial characters. This is a black character known as the foreign servant. And he comes outside because Punch is making a noise and he starts sort of trying to get Punch to go away and hitting him. And of course he ends up the same way. Uh, he talks in a, a stereotypical uh, foreign accent um 
using these instead of the. So you know, this is the this is the day. Uh, this is the day, Mr. Punch. I do I do like the white man. Um, so the black character is established there. Again, we don't know we don't know um, so much about the older shows. There was a, a man in London, in uh, England, a, a year or two ago, and he was interviewed about having a, a black character based on a blackface minstrel. And he was on live TV and somebody somebody made a comment about getting rid of it. And he said, oh, this character has been in the show since 1662. Rubbish. We don't know that. We, um, and certainly, if there was a black character in 1662, it wasn't a minstrel in that sort of way. Um, so as you can imagine, particularly these days, it's a very controversial uh, character still. Um, so this was the first published show. Of course, people want to see the shows. And in the uh, Puccini, Puccini died, as I say, in the workhouse, 1835. Um, he went in the workhouse in about 1831. Died 1835, been very old in his late 80s or maybe even 90s. Uh, his apprentice was a man called Tom Pike. And um, Tom Pike is credited with bringing the first live dog to play Dog Toby, which we'll look at in a little while. Um, but we fast forward to the 1840s. And Henry Mayhew in his uh, London Poor, his uh, famous volume of interviews with uh, uh, working people and poor people in London in the 1840s, this one, um, he interviews this punch man. It's the longest interview of the street performers. And it's probably where we get most of our information about Victorian punches. Um, we don't know the man's name, sadly, but he claims he bought his puppets from Puccini. He said when he went to see him, uh, he was, you know, he was too old. The puppets were just in a corner and he bought them. By the time he'd been interviewed, he'd been playing for around 25 years, so he said. So... He would have um, he would have probably probably started just after just after Piccini stopped playing. Um, he was recruited by a friend, and um, he was first the assistant, and then after a while, his friend trained him up, and he started working uh, working the streets with the punch. He tells us there were eight players at this time and they all knew each other and quite often they they swapped pitches or they they swapped um swapped equipment they swapped musicians and he makes it very clear in this that um he has different markets he has the street market he has the fairs sometimes the 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 gentry invite a group of artists to the house or outside the house, maybe for a garden party. And he would go there with uh, you know, some acrobats or some other musicians, some other puppet players. And um, he famously makes a comment that the show is changing. He talks about Puccini's show and he said, the blind man, pretty Polly, and a character called Mary Andrew who was a, a kind of stock fool. Uh, Puccini doesn't include him, but obviously other punch players did. And he says, these characters are, are gone. They're done with. And he then talks about things like ghosts, um, other characters that uh, um, are in his show. And he's very eloquent. It's, if you haven't read it, it's a wonderful interview. He's very, very amusing guy 
Um, as I say, sadly, we don't know his name. And he then talks about the fact that he has two audiences. He has the street audience who he can be very, um, very rowdy with. He can, uh, he can do a lot of different jokes. And then he says there are very gentle folk, as he calls them sentimental. And he says, these people who want the sentimental show are very sentimental themselves. They won't have no devil, no coffin, um, no ghost. And they, they, they want it kind of without these things. And it, this is where he says, it's spoiling the performance, sir. It's the march of intellect. And that's, <laughs> this is where I get the title from. So he, he talks about this fact that the audience is changing. And uh, um, scholars like Shersho have, have actually suggested this is where the, um, the middle classes, the upper classes are borrow, you know, they're appropriating this kind of working class tradition and they're cleaning it up, they're uh, sanitizing it. Um, I'll leave that question in the air because I'm still in two thoughts about it myself, but excuse me. I oh, know this water's very yellow. <laughs> um, that's Dr. Hayes' suggestion that I should have some orange colored water next to me, so. <laughs> Okay, um, so this is, a, as I said, this very in-depth interview, um, and he does his show, and there are characters in his show that aren't in the Bacini show. Um, so if we look at some later, later figures, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, photographs of Bacini's puppets. So uh, one thing this guy says is he says, I'm probably going to die in the workhouse. He said, Puccini died in the workhouse and Mr. Pike died in the workhouse and I'll probably follow them. Uh, so unfortunately, we, we, we don't know what happened to him uh, and not knowing his name, we can't find out. But if we look at some of these later ones, we've got Punch, we've got Judy, we've got a crocodile, hooray. Um, if we look over here, we've got the, the sausages. These always get a laugh in Poland because we don't have these kind of sausages really. So um, uh, we've got the stick. Now, interestingly, that stick doesn't look like a slapstick. Um, I suspect more modern performers brought the slapstick in to greater use. Uh, some of the books about how to do Punch and Judy from the early 20th century, they just have a solid stick. Um, and we can see there, there's a ghost's head, there's a devil, there's a dragon, um, the clown. It could either be a clown or it could be Judy, I'm not quite sure. Um, and we've got the, the front there, and we've got the coffin up on the, on the left there. This is the coffin that the, the hangman ends up in. Uh, I've seen an Italian show where he doesn't fit in the coffin, so they break his legs. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Great, gruesome. Um, if we look at this other one, this other set here, we've got Judy and the baby. We've got the beadle. So the constable who comes to arrest Mr. Punch, today we would think of a policeman with the, 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 the tall helmets. These came in later, probably when the, these helmets came in, because they would be a novelty. People would enjoy seeing it. Uh, here, We've got someone who looks more like a beadle with his rod of office. Obviously, these days, everyone calls him Mr. Bumble because of the, the Dickens connection. Uh, we've got a puppet dog, Toby. And then we've got the black gentleman at the back who I think is, uh, I think is based on a minstrel. And we've got the clown here. The clown is known as Joey after Joseph Grimaldi, who was this 18th century clown. Um, tradition runs that he's the only character who never gets hit, but I have seen at least one script where he does, but amongst players, at least today, there's a tradition that Joey never gets hit. He's too quick and too clever. 
And of course, there's the sausages, uh, which the crocodile usually eats, as you can see there. Um, so, as you can see here, this one's actually an American figure. Um, the character changes by the time of Mayhew's character. Uh, it has already changed from being a black servant to a blackface minstrel. Um, uh, Thomas Royce, the American performer, he brought over the Jim Crow character, um, had a song and dance about uh, Jump Jim Crow. And if you read Mayhew, you find out there's several Ethiopian bands, as they call it, people doing blackface uh, performances. And uh, in Britain, we still had it on the TV till the 1980s. So, you know, um, it was quite popular. Um, we can see here in the, in the other picture, we've got a, a gentleman with a beard. He's probably a character called Shalabala. And Shalabala was another um, oriental, if you like, ethnic character. And all he can say is Shalabala. So Punch says, good morning, you go, Shalabala. What's your name? Shalabala. And this is all he can say. And then Punch says something about, why don't you say something else? He says, I can only say Shalabala. And at, at that point, he gets dispatched. Um, so we've, we've got these kind of ethnic characters. Obviously, a lot of them have fallen by the wayside. Um, a lot of modern performers, um, still have the black character. Some of them do, do him as a minstrel. Some of them have integrated him, maybe making the character of the doctor uh, a black character or a policeman could be black or it could be a, a health and safety officer. So um, we, we kind of like to keep him in, partly for historic reasons, but also in a way it's actually reflecting the society. You know, if we have a black policeman or a, um, uh, something like this. The minstrel really is going out of fashion, particularly after a few years ago and with the current situation. Um, so when Mayhew's man talks about him, he, uh, he actually talks about, um, he uses the N word and he says, uh, he sings and he's saying things like every, every day. Uh, I'd be here every day, Mr. Punch. And he says, because that's how that's how they speak, he says. So you can see that, again, we're taking this thing from the theatres. Um, now, this picture here, it's by a painter called Robert Hayden in 1829. And it's called Mayday or Punch. And unfortunately, you probably won't see it if I get it up, but here, um, you can find this online probably. Here it actually says Pike's Pulcinella. And so looking at the puppets there, it's like Punch and Scaramouche, just like uh, Piccini's. And it would seem to be that this is actually a picture of Mr. Pike's show. Um, so Pike, as I said, the, uh, the Mayhew interview says that Pike was responsible for the, um, the first dog, Toby, uh, the first live dog, Toby. And uh, as we see here, there's a live dog there. Uh, again, you, you might find this, you probably find this very hard to read, but if we look down here, we can see Punch and Toby. And Toby actually becomes a bigger star. You know, we don't need the woman. We can have a dog. You know, it's, it's a bit, bit more fun having a dog. Um, I, I, I used to have a, a, a puppet Toby, but within the 20th century, the laws about performing animals, less and less people used live Tobys. Uh, by about the 1950s, I think they were gone. Um, interestingly enough, Mayhew's man mentions this, he says that the show is called Punch and Toby by some people. Now this is about 15, 20 years after the interview. This is about the 1860s, this picture. 
Um, but we can see Toby's still quite an important character. And even in some books in about 1920s, 1940s, I think, uh, there was a children's book called Gobelino the Witch's Cat. And Gobelino the Cat becomes a Toby dog uh, working in a fairground. Um, so again, very popular, trained dog. Whether Pike actually introduced him is highly debatable. Um, from what we know of Pike, he was a showman. He was connected with other artists and probably people had performing animals. Uh, Mayhew's man says that Pike introduced the first live dog, Toby, and it was a huge hit. Um, interestingly enough, I was talking to Tracy the other day about M.R. James in one of his stories, a uh, story of an appearance and disappearance. It's set in 1837. And the, the narrator says, there's this new phase about dog, live dog Tobies. And we're trying to work out whether James had actually read Mayhew because the first live dog Tobies would have been a, about at least 10 years earlier than that. Um, if we accept the idea that uh, Pike introduced them. So James might have read Mayhew and got a bit of rough mathematics. Um, however, he, he was wrong that uh, 1837 was, was a time of a new thing of the dog Toby. Um, if we look at the picture, we can see it's a street performance. Um, you see quite a lot of adults. Punch was very much geared towards adults rather than uh, children. And, you know, things like children's literature hadn't really become a thing. Um, as we said before, they, uh, they, would play, they would play in different places. Um, if there were markets and fairs, they would travel out play in the villages all the way to the big fair um, and then play back again having to repair their own uh, their own figures so this one's called on the road to derby 1870 the other one is 1890 and we're still using the same the same thing okay um, Charles Dickens. Charles Dickens loved Punch and Judy. Hello, I've got something in Polish there. Um, in 1849, uh, a lady called Mary Tyler wrote to him asking Mr. Dickens for his help in ridding the streets of this terrible Punch and Judy, which was such a bad influence on people. And Dickens replies to Mary Tyler, November 1849, says, in my opinion, street punch is one of those extravagant reliefs from the realities of life, which would lose its hold on people if it were made moral and instructive. I regard it as quite harmless in its influence and as an outrageous joke, which no one in existence would think of regarding as an incentive to any kind of action or as a model of any kind of conduct. It's possible, I think, that one secret source of pleasure very generally derived from this performance is the satisfaction the spectator feels in circumstances that the likenesses of men and women can be so knocked about without pain and suffering. And a lot of the modern punch players now still use that as, a, as an example of, you know, if people complain about political correctness, um, we say, well, people complain to Charles Dickens and look what he said. Um, Punch and Judy appears in the old curiosity shop. And we've got a picture here of Codlin and Short, the Punch and Judy players, uh, repairing their things in a graveyard. Um, the Mayhew's character, Mayhew's interviewee, actually says that he, th he, um, he thinks he was the model for it. He says that he, was, uh, he and his friend were repairing their stuff when the artist saw them. So he claims credit for that as well. Um, being, being a good showman, like he's, he knows all the right people and uh, whether it's true or not. Um, 
However, some people have said actually the character of Quilp is probably based on Punch. He's got the same characteristics. He's got hunchback. He's got a big nose, a bad temper. And so, you know, a lot of people think this is the case. Um, some people have said that Codlin and Short um, are based on one of the oldest, probably the oldest Punch and Judy players in Britain, uh, the Codman family. But um, it's not really the case. Uh, you, you'll, you'll see people come up with this, but this was written in 18, 1841 or published in 1841. And the Codman family didn't start performing Punch and Judy till 1860. So, uh, well, M.R. James uses similar names for his characters in uh, Story of an Appearance and Disappearance. So the Codman family are, they're what we would know as the Swatchel Omi, the, the Swatchel men. And the, they, they were based in two places, Clandudno, which is a, a seaside town uh, in Wales, in North Wales, and Liverpool. And the story goes that Richard Codman, he was a traveling performer, he was, he was descended from Hungarian gypsies and he was born 1831. And in 1860, he found himself in Clandudno. His horse had died, his caravan couldn't get anywhere. So he got some driftwood and carved some puppets and started performing Punch and Judy. Um, he wanted to perform on the seafront, but Lord Mostyn, who owns all this area, wouldn't allow him permission. So he started performing to miners. There's some mines near the town, and he started performing to the miners at the beginning and end of the shifts. So again, we can see that the Punch and Judy show is actually geared towards adults at this time. Um, so Richard Codman uh, started doing this 1860. During the winter, Obviously, the seaside isn't the best place to go. So he went up to Liverpool. He started playing at the uh, Lime Street station. If you go to Lime Street now, there's a kind of statue of a Punch and Judy player. And there, there used to be a pub called the Punch and Judy. It was a bit of a dive, actually. I think it got blown up or set fire to a couple of years ago. Um, but for years, the Codman family played Clandudno, and another branch of the Codman family played Liverpool. So these top ones are Richard Codman in Clandudno and uh, possibly his son, Richard Jr., playing in Liverpool. And uh, the bottom two are again Clandudno. And the one in the middle is the current theatre. It's something like the fifth generation. Uh, a chap called Jason, Jason Milban Codman. He plays it. Uh, he tells me that a lot of the puppets are still the original ones. And the, the frame there is, as you, as you might see, it's the same as the one down here. Um, and they still do the same script, which means they have the hanging, they have the devil, uh, the devil has big teeth. Uh, so why is that? It looks like a vampire. And he said, well, in a period when uh, there's a lot of religious feeling in North Wales, probably the Methodist uh, revival, things like this, people didn't want the devil. And as Dracula was popular, he put fangs on it and made it into a vampire. Uh, and it still has them. Um, uh, Funnily enough, a, a, a few years ago, um, a performer was going to play at a school in, in the Midlands of England, and the, uh, the headmaster decided that maybe they wouldn't have this horribly politically incorrect Punch and Judy show in the school, and instead they would be better taking the children on a day trip to the seaside. And I was writing to this guy and he said, I tone my show down for kids. He said, do you know where they're going? They're going to Flandern, no. 
and there they get the Victorian hanging scene <laughs> and everything. So you know, these, this headmaster sent these kids into the, the mouth of uh, traditional Victorian Punch and Judy. Um, the Liverpool Codmans, I believe, died. Uh, the, last, the last player died a few years ago, um, 10, 10, 20 years ago. And so the, uh, the Clan Dudno family is still going. Um, so they're very approachable. You can go and speak to them. And they've got lots of information about the family there. Um, I got these pictures, uh, most of these pictures, off the uh, Punch and Judy website, uh, which I'll, I'll show you at the end. Um, what happens? Punch gets very popular. It becomes very mainstream. You get um, ceramics down here. Lovely. I, I love this. I love these teapots. I believe you can get new ones now. Uh, my wife's going to have to clear out the, the crockery cupboard because I want, I want a set of those. Um, door brasses, um, brass knockers. Funnily enough, I was in a, I was in a, uh, like a junk shop here in Poland a few, few months ago, and I found a, I found a, a brass, a brass uh, poker for the fire, and my wife suddenly says, "That's Judy on the top, isn't it?" And I, I hadn't noticed. Um, so they're, they're quite popular now. Children's entertainment, as we said. Um, Things begin to go towards children's entertainment. Uh, as we can see here, we've got a big show, 1884, huge show, all kids. Um, you get toys, wind up players, you get paper theatres with Punch and Judy on. Um, which, interestingly enough, Mr. James said the first time he saw a, a, a ghost was a character in a Punch and Judy show, probably a paper theatre. Um, so it was really, really mainstream. Uh, obviously, it's although it's still recognisable, it's got less and less so um, these days. But there's still a market for this, this old style memorabilia. Um, we find, find them in books as well. This is Tom Brown's school, uh, Tom Brown's school days. Um, Tom goes to the fair and he meets a, you know, he sees the Punch and Judy show. Uh, in those days, Punch used to say, uh, root to toy. He used to come on and go, root to toy, root to toy. These days, he'd say things like, that's the way to do it. Or uh, So even the language of Punch has changed. Um, the interesting picture here is he's holding this rod in one hand. I don't know how he's doing it. Um, it's not really possible. Uh, Lewis Carroll in Through the Looking Glass talks about Alice watching the knights and says they hold their sticks like Punch and Judy. And in the illustration, you can see that they, they hold the stick with the hands across the body. It doesn't explain that. It just says they hold them like Punch and Judy. So whoever was reading it would know what that looked like. Um, if we look at some of these old pictures, we can see that. Um, the other significance with the children's shows is Michael Byram, who is one of the, the main historians of Punch, he commented that when you examine the 19th century plays, the 19th century scripts, towards the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, they get more and more geared towards children. The dialogue changes, uh, some of the action changes, and then into the 20th century, audience participation becomes a bigger thing. Um, if you watch the Codman show, there's no, hardly any audience participation. Possibly an influence from the pantomime, but into the 20th century, audience participation becomes bigger and bigger. Um, and it's really only these older performers who, who might still keep it, the older traditions. Um, Mayhew's man talks about something called punchman slang. I had a, a, a friend of mine who's a theatre guy recently came very excited and said, have you heard of Polari? And Polari was this, this gay slang. It was a slang used by the, the gay community in Britain post-World War II up until the 1970s. 
And um, I, I said, yes, I do. He was very disappointed because, um, and Punch's man talks about showman slang called palare. And it's very much, when you compare the two, you can see this, this gay polari, it's descended from this punchman slang. And it's a mixture of things like Italian words, uh, Yiddish words, so the word swazzle uh, for the mouthpiece, this could be come from svatsen, a uh, Yiddish word for chattering. Um, and rhyming slang, things like this. So if we have a look here, we've got bona parlare, so this is the punchman's slang. You know, he speaks bona parlare. He speaks good slang. Uh, bonar is good. Um, Chaffling Homa, a talking man, could also be an informant to the police. Uh, Donna for a woman. Castello for a, a, a booth. Um, and Shantabivari, a glass of beer. So you can see these Italian influences here. Um, again, this is off the Punch and Judy website. Uh, oops. Yoita Bivari, no drink. A very important thing for a, a punch man, you know, to be able to say that. Bona Bivari. Mm -hmm. um, tabora for a drum, you know, like a tabor. And uh, it's, it's quite interesting looking at this and then comparing it with the the 60s, the 60s Polari. Um, so that's uh, that's pretty much me. Uh, I hope that's been of enjoyment to you. Uh, the sources, Michael Byram, uh, most of the histories are old. There, there are some more recent ones, but I haven't read, I haven't read the more recent ones. Um, Glyn Edwards, who's a practicing performer, uh, he writes about kind of the modern tradition and the connection. Some guy called Trevor Hill wrote a, an article for a Polish journal called Acta, Acta Near Philologia. Um, and most of, most of the information comes from these other sources. Uh, Wyndham Hollis, Punch's Progress, has a lot of sh little short in articles with Punch performers. Robert Leach is, is one of the more recent um, things 1985 i have some issues with it i think he's a bit idealistic but great pictures great pictures um henry mayhew of course scott cutler sherwo who i've mentioned um george spate is the main historian for puppetry in britain he is the uh he's the late george spate but he um he got this history of the English puppet theatre. He also did one on Punch and Judy, but it's basically part of that. And he, he has some very interesting stuff in there. A lot of the pictures and the information, particularly about Pike, uh, Christopher van der Kratz, who's uh, he's an Australian, and uh, he actually found out about uh, Tom Pike and his death date. He researched the um, he researched the uh, archives of the, the 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 workhouse and found out uh, about him and and the Punch and Judy on the web, which is actually based in uh, Colwyn Bay near Llandudno, Um They've got a lot of information on there. Van der Kratz has got a lot of the historical things, a lot of detail. He's a researcher. Uh, the Punch and Judy on the web. Um, a lot of pictures, a lot of diverse information. So if anybody's into finding out more, these are the places to look. There's also a book by a gentleman called Jeff Felix that I've just ordered off Amazon 2016. Uh, that's the year, not the price. Um, and uh, Jeff Felix actually found out the, um, the death dates and things of Puccini he, he's like the ultimate historian of punch. Um, so I hope that's been of use to everybody. And uh, I think we can. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Wait.
a bit of this bunch to throw me down here. Right. Come and say goodbye as well. Well, thank you very much. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Bye-bye. You see, Mr. Punch.